Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to day 44 of Humanity Rising. Every day since the 22nd of May, between 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock p.m. Central European time, we broadcast live to between 10 and 15,000 people a day through our live streaming partners and here on our Zoom line to enable people from all over the world to come together and share their experiences of how they're navigating through this extraordinary pandemic. And more fundamentally, to take counsel with one another as to how we can more effectively have an impact as we shape the post-pandemic world. In the last 44 days, much has happened. And I want to just note a couple of things uh, as we begin the session uh, today. A couple of days ago, it was announced that there have been 10 million COVID cases worldwide and 500,000 deaths. One quarter of those deaths have been in the United States. I saw a graph today and it showed that while most of the world, the COVID cases are slowly going down, in the United States, they're spiking and we're the only country in the world uh, where the cases are skyrocketing. Uh, last uh, 24 hours, there were 53,000 new reported cases of COVID in the United States that marked a world record for the number of new cases in a 24 hour period. I wanna reflect on that for a moment and ask the question, why is it that while the rest of the world is dealing basically with the coronavirus, the United States of America has descended into a mess of incompetence, divisiveness, and the point blank refusal of large swaths of the population to wear masks or in any way comport themselves with basic hygiene that would be expected if you're in the middle of a pandemic. I believe there's a connection between the social political consternation in the United States and the fact that our coronavirus rates are skyrocketing. Just today, against the advice of the medical establishment, President Trump flew to Mount Rushmore, South Dakota, not wearing a mask and in a crowded amphitheater, gave a speech on the 4th of July that stoked the culture war that is currently engulfing the United States, calling for heightened security against left-wing fascism, and actually using terms, and his campaign has been actually using symbols taken out of the Third Reich. Just a month ago, a young black man, George Floyd, was killed by a white police officer. And not once did the president apologize or act in any way conciliatory, but has continued to stoke fear, hatred, racism. And if you look at Fox News, which airs 24-7, 365, that's all you hear coming out of Fox News. All the scientific data 
available to us indicates incontrovertibly that our environment, how we're feeling, our emotional state affects our immune system. It affects our health. And as the United States really descends into the morass of a failed state, we're unable to cope at even the most basic levels with a pandemic. The country is preoccupied with political division. And therefore the rates just keep going up and up and up. Now this is a very important point to ponder. What I've said may not be the whole answer as to why the United States as an exception to the rest of the world is increasingly afflicted by this pandemic. But it does bring into very sharp relief the subject that we're going to contemplate now on how we can co-creatively, collaboratively build a culture of love and wisdom. And I wanted to just underscore this point because Oftentimes when we see a title like cultivating a culture of love and wisdom, we think that's kind of idyllic and uh, idealistic, maybe a little woo-woo uh, woo -woo or new age. But I will tell you uh, from the depth of my being, that how we treat one another affects our health. And it's in this spirit that I would like to turn the program now over to David Lorimer, who's the program director of the Scientific Medical Network and the founding chief executive of Character Education Scotland who's very thoughtfully brought together a panel discussion uh, to lead us today on really a meditation of how we can cultivate increased love and will, wi wisdom in our lives and in the culture at large. So David, thank you so much for joining and I turn the program over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Jim, for those uh, very pertinent remarks um, for, for us to consider um, today and our panel and the, the situation. Um, and it's the 4th of July today. And one of my slides, it says that <clears throat> what uh, Rabbi Michael Lerner suggests is that it should, should eventually be Global Interdependence Day, not Independence Day. So I'm going to share my screen and just give um, a, um, a presentation to introduce the... Right, so everybody can see that. I can see it, it seems to be working. So co-creating a culture of love and wisdom. And what I'm going to do here is really give you some more like what the French call grande ligne. Um, one obviously can't cover everything um, in a short presentation. But just to give you some inspiration and sense of direction uh, as to where we might go um, with this. Um, oh, wait a minute. Uh, this is the. I think you just have to select your screen or use the error keys on your keyboard. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's what I was trying to do. Yeah. There we go. It's it's released itself. Um, this is not anything in particular. It's just a very very beautiful tranquil. Um, photograph of uh, from China. Um, <clears throat> so th this will definitely put your stress levels down if, if they are in, in any way elevated. So starting with um, William Gladstone, British Prime Minister, um, who said, we look forward to the time when the power to love 
will replace the love of power. Then will our world know the blessings of peace. And he was one of the great statesmen um, of, the, of the 19th century, a very man of deep faith and extraordinary energy. He was prime minister for 15 years or so of the 19th century. And as I just said um, a moment ago, um, Marabai Michael Lerner suggested that we, sh we should rename July the 4th as Global Interdependence Day. So let's say this is the first celebration online here of Global Inter Interdependence Day. And if there's one message that <clears throat> I want to underscore um, in this presentation is love as a spiritual power. Love as a spiritual power. And so I'm going to go quite quickly through a number of slides here um, from quite, quite a range of thinkers, uh, but all pointing in the same direction. This is Lewis Mumford, The Transformations of Man. Let's make a basic assumption. The destiny of mankind after its long preparatory period of separation and differentiation is at last to become one. And Charles Eisenstein, who's, who's been very prominent um, in the last few months, uh, looks like we, you're moving from a, an age of separation um, to an age of reunion. And this is really amounts to a, what, what we need is a change of world view. Um, and this, to me, um, is an evolutionary um, imperative. Oh, and I seem to have, oh yeah, it seems I seem to be clicking down to the left. So Mumford suggests that the principal task today is create a new self and will seek not to impose, and this is a critical phrase, a mechanical uniformity, and this is one possible outcome from the COVID crisis, but rather to help bring about an organic unity. And so the new, this culture is nourished not only by a new vision of the whole, which includes the planet, but a new vision of self, uh, capable of understanding cooperating with this whole. And this is a moment of transformation. And <clears throat> what I suggest here is it's really a transformation of worldview um, that we need. These are what I call, these are my starting points, what I call the principles of the common good. There is one life represented by the energy of life. There is one mind or consciousness. There is one heart represented by love. There is one planet, an ecosystem. There is one health represented by vitality and resilience. And in this sense, the picture I want to convey is that the metaphysics of oneness, which I've just um, stated with these postulates, if you like, implies an ethic of interconnectedness. And I explain this in my book, Resonant Mind, or um, originally it was called Hole in One, Hole with a W. Although I'm a golfer, it wasn't a hole in one, H-O-L-E. I've never had a hole in one. Uh, and this is, uh, the, the ethic here is the golden rule. I just want to say a little bit about cycles of civilization, um, the growth and rise of civilizations and their decay and fall. And implicitly, what um, Jim was talking about at the beginning there were these signs of disintegration and decay. So if you go back to the 18th century, um, you've got Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Then in about 1825, you've got Hegel's dialectics um, with his um, philosophy of history, his book, Philosophy of History. And these, these, these he built on this, the 18th century idea of progress and enlightenment. Um, and evolution. And, and we don't, however, um, you know, have a system uh, or a, a cultures um, which continue to evolve in, as it were, a straight line. Cultures are cyclical. Uh, and this is what has been observed by the various thinkers that I list just now. Oswald Spengler, uh, Decline of the West, 1917. Arnold Toynbee, uh, the study of history in 12 volumes, um, 1935 to 1960. Um, and I'll come back to this 5% in a moment. Albert Schweitzer, The Decay and Restoration of Civilization, Civilization and Ethics. Peter M. Sorokin, who was the first professor of sociology at Harvard as a Russian, and uh, social and cultural dynamics in the, culture, the, the crisis of our age. Jean Gebser, The Ever-Present uh, Image, origin, sorry, the ever-present origin, Claire Graves' um, spiral dynamics, Fritjof Capra, the turning point, 
William Ophuls, who I've, I've just read recently, and I highly recommend his book, Immoderate Greatness, and, and uh, Letter to My Grandchildren. I reviewed these in the last issue of my journal. And then Nicholas Hager, who almost nobody knows about, um, whose book, The Fire and the Stones, and then he also has one called The Rise and Fall of Civilizations. So these are people who've been talking about this cyclical nature and um, of civilization. Now, the reason for putting 5% in here is that Toynbee had this theory of the creative minority, that, they, that those who were the creators of the next cycle of civilization or culture and were, were never more than 5% um, of the existing culture. And he called these the creative minority. Uh, and this has been taken up by others more recently in, in, in terms of what's, what's called the, the cultural creatives. And, and so uh, the, the fact that it's only a small number of people um, who create cultural change um, should be encouraging um, because uh, it means that um, small numbers of people, as Margaret Mead suggested, uh, are those who can actually bring about significant change. Now, here's Arnold Toynbee, the historian, 1889-1975. Um, and this is rather surprising in some senses. This comes from his book, Experiences. Love, he says, as we know it by direct experience in living creatures on this planet, is also present as a spiritual presence behind the universe. Key sentence, spiritual presence behind the universe. All the mystics tell us this. Love is the only spiritual power that can overcome the self-centeredness that is inherent in being alive. This love that is a form of self-denial is also the only true self-fulfillment. Really a profound observation from historians, historians' view on religion um, and his book Experiences. Then this is a famous quotation, which some of you may well know, um, Václav Havel, a speech to US Congress, where he says, without a global revolution in the sphere of human consciousness, nothing will change for the better in our being as humans and the catastrophe towards which the world is headed will be unavoidable. We're still incapable of understanding that the only genuine backbone of our actions, if they are to be moral, is responsibility. Responsibility to something higher than my family, my country, my firm, my success. Responsibility to the order of being where all our actions are indelibly recorded and where and only where they will be judged. Very profound observation from the writer and former president of the Czech Republic. Now we come back to uh, Sorokin again. And this is his great book, um, republished by the Templeton Press in, in 2004, originally published in 1954, and based on, on research, The Ways and Power of Love. And, and this was what he realized after he was imprisoned by both sides in the Russian Revolution. And so he was in the Peter and Paul prison in St. Petersburg, waiting to be executed. And here was his conclusion that hate begets hate. Um, Jim has already said that. In, in relation to the stoking of violence. Violence engenders violence. Hypocrisy is answered by hypocrisy. War generates war and love creates love. It's very straightforward, really. <laughs> Unselfish love has enormous creative and therapeutic potentialities, far greater than most people think. I emphasize that, far greater than most people think. Love is a life-giving force necessary for physical, mental, and moral health. And then he analyzes different aspects of love. Uh, and so when we think about love, um, we, we need to, to work out at what level uh, we're actually talking. And so he, he, he distinguishes between the religious and divine aspect of love, agape, also experiences bliss and joy, satchit ananda, ethical aspect of love as goodness, the ontological aspect of love, ontological relates to being, um, it's unifying and harmonizing capacity. The physical aspect of love, uniting, integrating force. And indeed in French, um, the word for gravity is attraction, same as attraction. Psychological aspect of love, merging with the beloved, altruism um, and fearlessness. The social aspect of love, cooperation, co-creation, mutual aid. Um, this mutual aid phrase comes from Prince Kropotkin, who, who wrote a book of that title about 100 years ago. And then uh, Sorokin sum, sums his view up by saying that emanating from the supraconscious, validated by logical reasons and confirmed a posteriori by sensory experience, 
the universal sublime love is the supreme value around which all moral values can be integrated into one ethical system valid for the whole of humanity. Very powerful statement. And he emphasized in his research and that it was the people who had profound transformative unitive experiences uh, who really changed, not those people who just changed their theology. And I, I'm reminded of a, 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 an incident which Raymond Moody has in one of his books on near-death experiences, when an evangelical has a near-death experience and they recover and they, they, he, they're asked, uh, well, what did you learn? And the man said, God isn't interested in theology. He wants to know what's in your heart. Now, I'm introducing a figure here, many of you probably don't know, um, called Ben Saduno, which is his spiritual name, um, uh, Peter Dunoff, a Bulgarian sage who lived from 1864 to 1944. You just need to look into his eyes on the left and you'll see something <clears throat> um, quite special. I I've written uh, books, I've translated his prayers. Uh, my book is called Prophet for Our Time, Prophet with P-O- P-R-O-P-H-E-T, not P-R-O-F-I-T, Prophet for Our Times, and it's got a forward by Wayne Dyer. Um, here we are in the Bulgarian mountains in the 1930s, and, and this what, he, what's, what he's doing here is called panurythmy, and you can see him in the center doing the gesture for liberation. Uh, and so you've got musicians, and you've got this wonderful landscape, which I've stood in and danced in many times, and, and uh, the music is the music was written by by Dunoff, and all uh, the movements are symbolic, and, and so what the what this actually means is is universal harmony of movement, a pan eurythmy. That's the literal meaning of uh, when you look at it etymologically in Greek. And this is an extraordinary thing to do with others because the musicians are in the center. And then you dance in, in couples round, round the side. And if there are too many of them, then there are three or four rings. If you look this up on YouTube, you'll see Arela Mountains, Panurythmy. It's, it's quite an extraordinary sight. Anyway, I'm going to explain a little bit of, of what he had to say about a culture of love. And these are the principles of the pentagram, which is a part of the Panurythmy, it's the five-pointed star, are love, wisdom, truth, justice or equity, um, and virtue. And I have here, um, I have a pentagram which I wear around my neck, um, which has these five principles um, on it. And so love stands for life and the heart, sense of peace and joy, wisdom, light in the mind, illumination. Truth is love plus wisdom, implying freedom and integrity and justice and virtue and goodness, they don't need any further explanation. Um, but what he said is that the, the power of these principles is that you can embody them. You don't have to believe in a set of propositions. Um, you, can, you have to believe in the principle and embody the principle, believe in love, believe in wisdom, believe in truth and integrity and freedom, believe in justice, believe in virtue or goodness. And as human beings, um, we, uh, we have these three capacities, um, basic capacities, the heart, the mind, and the will, corresponding to love, warmth, peace, and joy, to wisdom, light, and clarity, and to uh, strength and resilience. And we need all three of these capacities in order to be balanced human beings. Now, I want to say a little bit about his um, stages of evolution and consciousness, and you'll understand why um, in, in, in a moment as I go through this. And so his, his overall scheme is that, that the, the creation moves from the one to the many, and then from involution to evolution, but then the many back to the one. And so our quest as human beings is going back towards the one, is, is this sense of oneness, this sense of connection, this sense of love that we feel in ourselves. And he, he explains, um, his scheme is that we, you firstly have the the, the, what the, the original uh, collective consciousness, then the development of individual consciousness, then um, uh, social collective consciousness characterized by solidarity. Um, and then at the moment, so we're, we're at a stage of being between these individual and collective. Um, but ultimately, uh, he says, we're moving towards cosmic consciousness, which is the 
sense of oneness and therefore oneness with life and oneness with others and divine consciousness um, where the unity is known and felt. And then he explains um, these four degrees of human culture. And you can see that all of these, all of these degrees of human culture are actually present in the current world. So the, the question is how one um, proceeds in the downward direction, as it were, away from violence towards law, justice, and ultimately love. Uh, so the, uh, the, 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 the degree of culture represented by violence is characterized by force, domination, and power. There's plenty of that around. That's the red um, in the spiral dynamics. Then the law um, is, is an external authority um, using threats and control um, to try and keep things in order. Um, justice, however, moves to a more impersonal universal principle, excluding individual privilege. And love is represented by life for the whole. Um, and this is, this is a critical um, phrase that the service to, to the whole of life, service to being is a life for the whole. And in this sense, um, love is characterized by Dunoff as a force in the mind, which is where you, can, you live for this uh, and you are an exemplar of this. And the principle in the spirit um, which is the principle of reconciliation and harmony. So Gandhi reflects this by saying, love is basically not an emotional, but an ontological power, which he himself demonstrated, the essence of life, the dynamic union of the separated. So this is what, this is a slide about um, the, the, towards the culture of love, saying that love is necessary for the transformation of the world. And note he says it's the only force which can bring peace um, between the nations, um, <clears throat> each of which has a mission to accomplish. And it is beginning to appear, it's a question of time. So this is where we need to hang in there um, in this rather chaotic situation. Religions, he said, need to be purified. They all contain something divine, but it's been obscured as we know with the repeated addition of human conceptions. So all believers have to get together and agree on this one single principle to make love the basis of any and every belief, love and brotherhood, that's the common basis. The Dalai Lama said something very, very similar in a lecture I um, <clears throat> watched um, um, this week. This uh, diagram, uh, I just put this in for illustrative purposes. This is uh, um, something that comes out of some, uh, an organization I'm connected with called the International Futures Forum. And, <clears throat> and um, it was, it was uh, constellated by um, Professor Brian Goodwin on, on 12th September 2001, when he was teaching at Schumacher College. And he said, we can either react to 9-11 through fear, alienation, control, um, or we could react to it by participation and belonging, moving in one direction of fear or love. And Michael Lerner in his book suggests an alternative um, reaction of the US administration if they say, well, we are not going to use the kind of violence that's been inflicted on us, we are going to choose love, choose life. I won't go into that. So I'm coming to an end moment. So I just want to characterize a few shifts that I see um, potentially happening and uh, other panel members will um, want to, to build on some of these. Shifts of emphasis from separation to wholeness, fear to love, competition to partnership and cooperation, greed to caring, what Michael Lerner calls the caring society, outer to inner authority, force to power um, in the sense of um, David Hawkins. Some of you will be familiar with his work, for Power Versus Force, and Individual to Universal. And then I see a number of emerging harmonies here, science and mysticism. We organized the Sci Mystics and Scientists Conference, conscious and the superconscious, not just the unconscious, medicine and healing, reason and intuition, outer and inner, material and spiritual, masculine and feminine, and sexuality and spirituality, which again will come up later on, I think. And so uh, summing this up, um, I, I, my vision um, is the oneness of life and consciousness, as I explained at the beginning. Uh, the sense of awakening as both individual and collective. So each of us has an important role to play. 
we need we don't just need sustainability we need regeneration of the earth systems and the ethic is of the power of love not the love of power implying reciprocity and mutuality uh, we need to integrate mind heart and will and get to work and cultural values that we need to base our new culture on those of love respect uh, in implying unity in diversity trust generosity wisdom truth freedom peace and justice you may have others to add but these seem essential to me so i just want to quote from <clears throat> one of our panelists and um, this was uh, uh, a tamara newsletter um, recently and and uh, uh, she may want to um, expand on this and, and she and Dita Doom wrote sometimes we experience this point where the divine breaks through and leads us for a short time into a world of grace, strength, and great universal love. This is not a private experience, not just the experience of an individual ego, but in this experience beats the heart of the whole world and the global heart of all humanity. It is the message of a world that is always directed towards unity, love, and healing. We call it the sacred matrix. It is the most reliable foundation for the formation of a movement capable of connecting with the universal forces and healing the heart of humanity. Very powerful vision. Um, this is exactly what we need. And so I'm going to finish um, before I say something about um, uh, Michael Lerner and have his clip with Sorokin. And he, he must have written this in the 1950s. We have a choice before us, either to continue our predatory policies of individual and tribal selfishness that lead to inevitable doom, or to embark upon the policies of universal solidarity that brings humanity to the aspired for heaven on earth. Well, the choice is still there. And here, here is a, <clears throat> another correspondingly beautiful um, photograph. Although it, it does give a sense of a slight, slight precariousness um, there. You, you wouldn't want to to be tipping around in your boat, uh, otherwise you might find yourself swimming. Um, so resources here, uh, just to um, put you in the picture, scientific medical network, uh, scimednet.org. Um, we have our webinars, um, we had one with Michael Lerner recently, and we had one with Andrew Fellows this morning. All our webinars are on mysticsandscientists.org. We've got Rianne Eisler coming up quite soon and other well-known people. GalileoCommission.org is our program on philosophy of science, um, we're calling for a new science of consciousness. And then we have uh, some of the um, uh, websites of the, of the panel members, AnayaSophia.com, Tamera.org, and Tacoon.org. And Stephen, you'll need to add yours um, in due course. So uh, <clears throat> just uh, this is a slide um, explaining some of the central ideas of uh, Michael Lerner from his book, um, Revolutionary Love, which I encourage you to read. Um, <clears throat> here it is. Um, he talks about a caring society, a love and justice movement, from the globalization of selfishness to the globalization of generosity, prophetic empathy, which we need to develop, um, and deep respect for everyone, uh, even if we disagree with them, environmental sanity, and significantly, I think for me, this he talks about the great deprivation of meaning, love, respect, and connection to a higher purpose. And he mentions um, that um, and the, the progressives um, have made a mistake in only concentrating on the outer needs of people and forgetting about the inner needs. Um, and, these, and this is one of the reasons why um, the, the, the people whose, whose interests are not actually served by, by, by Donald Trump um, actually voted for him. As one of them said, we know he's a jerk, but he's our jerk. So on that note, uh, I will exit my screen share. If I can find how to do that, or maybe Georg can do that for me as an exit. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, Georg is going to play um, the clip from Michael Lerner. I'd like now to ask you, uh, just to, for, for the benefit of, of everybody listening, uh, your, your, your definition of revolutionary love. Well, 
I don't know if I have a nice short one, but I t- tell you that it's like this. Um, revolutionary love is love that is directed towards every human being on the planet, that, may, uh, that recognizes that every human being on the planet deserves um, a, a life of generosity and caring, and, um, or what we call the caring society. And so revolutionary love is a love that is um, not just about one another. And this is, I, I mentioned, I think I privately when we were talking before, that some people in looking at the, the, the title revolutionary love immediately think, oh, this is some new age guy that is, you know, some, but uh, n- I'm not exactly new agey. Uh, it's it's um, um, it, it, the idea that we have and can care for the well-being of everyone on the planet. And that actually, um, that's not just because we have big hearts, but because we also have big enough heads to recognize that our well-being depends on the well-being of everyone else on the planet. And that consequently, it is extremely important for us to be involved in uh, uh, creating an economic and political system that enhances our capacity to care for everyone rather than as now we live in an economic and political system um, that enhances our sense of, oh, it's too big for us. I can't do anything on the large scale. What I need to do is look out for myself and maybe a few people in my life that I care about, but all any other level of caring is impossible and totally unrealistic because everybody knows that everybody on the planet is just out for themselves. Now I say that's not true. And that, in fact, there are um, huge numbers of people who would love to care for other people and often do. Um, we had an example of that in the, um, uh, in the 9-11 when uh, the two World Trade um, uh, buildings were brought down by um, uh, airplanes allegedly uh, driven by terrorists. And, um, and they, um, those two, um, uh, there were lots of people stuck in there and um, hundreds of people, hundreds and hundreds of people um, rushed into those buildings to try to save the lives of others. They didn't know these people. And amongst them, 300, actually 300 of the people who ran into, that bu- into those buildings actually died in the course of doing that. Um, so tremendous courage, caring for others that they don't know. Well, this kind of caring is also a factor in daily life. When you see somebody in deep trouble, most people respond by trying to help them in some way or other. Um, there, so um, I'm saying that the capacity to care for people that you don't really know is there in people, but there's a tremendous amount of propaganda um, that is, and it's not just from the media, it's also just from the, from the daily reality of life in capitalist society. You're working in a workplace where all day long, people are looking out for number one. Why? Because that's how it's structured. It's structured so that either your, yourself or at least your work group is in, in competition with other work groups in that same place and definitely with other, uh, other corporations. So you're there, the majority of uh, working people's lives are spent in such work, uh, workplaces and um, at least until they've retired. And so over and over again, they come to feel that everybody's out for themselves. And hence that, that it's ridiculous to think that you could build a different kind of world. Consequently, um, revolutionary love is not a, about just making little reforms of the, the sort that, um, let's say, um, well, even um, Bernie Sanders or, um, uh, you know, any most progressives when they're running for office, they have very good reforms. I'm all favor. I was all in favor of Bernie. I loved him, and etc. But um, actually, the world that we need is one in which the capitalist order is replaced by a different kind of society. And um, so, revolutionary love is about how you build the the steps along the way to make it there. And that. Yeah. So, I don't know if that helps. In, in, oh, in fantastic. Revolutionary love. <clears throat> thank, thank you very much. Uh, so that, that was um, um, Rabbi Lerner.
And, and I think the important point he makes is that we, we have to combine um, the inner and outer aspects, the inner and outer journeys. It's no use just doing the inner one or just doing the outer one. They have to be combined together. So what I'd like to do now um, is to um, bring in um, some of the panelists and uh, I'm going to ask uh, Sabine and Martin um, to, to come in first. Um, Sabine uh, Lichtenfels, I've described everybody um, on this, this as a visionary activist. I think we're all visionary activists. And I like the idea um, of Aldous Huxley when he said that um, he, he was a pacifist realist. Um, because realism, as Michael was implying, is, a, is, a, is linked with cynicism and pessimism. And that's not what we're, that's not what we're talking about at all. Um, so um, Sabine is, a, is an author and artist and co-founder of the, the Tamara community. Um, and her most recent book um, is They Knew Each Other, um, The End of Sexual Violence, which I have somewhere um, just to hand. And then Martin is the leader of the Institute for Global Peacework and is the younger voice on the panel, Tamara co-worker and co-initiator of the Defend the Sacred Alliance. So over, over to you, um, <clears throat> Sabine and Martin, and a very warm welcome to both of you. Hmm. So thank you. Thank you for welcoming us. This was quite... Uh, uh, intensive introduction with so many issues where one just could jump into and uh, to introduce myself uh, in the name of love i i feel it is really the most important point for us as humanity in in the moment to build universities where we can learn and study what is love about what is what is the definition of of love do we know one mm. And I have to, to say, I myself, I studied also theology. And in the exam, I was asked, what was the profession of Jesus? And my answer was, God, thanks, he was not a theologist. So <laughs> it is so much about this uh, life practice. If I think about what is revolution, I would say revolution is the challenge to find back to the system of evolution to come in contact with the system of evolution. And in Tamara, we are living here around 200 people with children and all together. And it's so much this question, for example, what is the shift from power to cooperation? How does it really work? Or if we use the word individual, then we, we know that the time of the last centuries was so much about creating the deeper individual consciousness. And we did not even notice that we are following a field of fear where a real growing of self-consciousness in a divine sense was not supported. And so Tamara is very much about a research. How can we build um, a social surrounding, a social area where we can learn love. And when I speak about love, I don't mean only the personal love between human beings. I mean the universal love on all levels, the spiritual love, the social love, the partnership love. And then I think we as human beings called a lot love what is not love. And this is maybe one reason that we were brainwashed in a society sense where suddenly our deepest longing shifts towards violence. And to, to figure out what is this about? How can we create? I feel Corona is showing us the yellow card of society that it's uh, about a system change. How can we come from fear to trust? So I like sometimes to, to use the example, if many dolphins are dying, we also don't look first, what is the virus? We see, wow, maybe we uh, destroyed the water where we destroyed the surrounding where they can live in. 
And I feel a virus is always showing us something where a society or the area where we live in is sick. And we have to figure out what is the core, what is the beginning, why is it like this? And on a spiritual level, I feel it as a message from the universe which is showing us humanity, are you ready now to really take your role on this globe where you are called to be? And this is for me uh, creating systems where we are in cooperation with the system what created us. So just in short words to introduce a bit uh, where I'm coming from, where we are doing our research. And especially now in this uh, moment we have no guests no guest season for us in Tamara the life doesn't change a lot because we are living here together and we are doing our work but it's really really very much about the question how can we survive as humanity uh, humanity what is really the shift what system change we have to figure out that we as humanity can survive and I feel that the earth and the divine life gives us a lot of answers if we are ready to deeply listen. Yeah, mm, so far from my much. side. Martin. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for this invitation. And yeah, I can also say that a lot, many thoughts are already triggered. So I will find my line now. I would maybe start by just also um, referring to the keyword of collapse of civilizations that when we speak about the, the pandemic or um, about the actions of the current uh, American government, um, that it's time and again for me so important to see the bigger picture in which this is happening right now, where we are really in a moment of, um, yeah, civilizational collapse, uh, implosion of empire, um, that is that is not just about a particular technology, a particular disease, but we are really talking about a transformation on the very foundations upon which culture has rested. And yeah, I, I think we we can agree in this conversation that really finding back to to the recognition of what actually love is is such a central turning point in this in this transformation that we are, that we are in and yeah, Gandhi you quoted him before um, with the sentence that love is not just an emotion but really an ontological power and uh, a reunion of that which uh, was separated and when we look at what that actually means then uh, we get an idea about the depth of the transformation that is necessary because um, we have a we have we have a system that continues um, to feed our very existence, but also is the foundation for our psychological and social design um, that continues to perpetuate separation through exploitation, through oppression, through violence. And um, in this project, um, some of the things that actually attracted me as a young person into this community um, had to do with bringing together different ideas or different notions for the transformation of society which usually are not together so for example um, one sentence of Karl Marx actually which is quoted often here is that, that that it is social being which determines consciousness so when we speak about love especially in the western context it is almost by default that we have such a small idea of it because we grow up in a society that always throws the individual back to his very own very narrow private sphere of life. And so there is um, a, a systemic level which makes love um, very often impossible, which is then perceived by individuals as their own personal fault, mm -hmm. which actually is um, much more the result of social, um, ecological, economic structures um, which always leads to separation, which lead to selfishness, to the things that Michael Lerner explained before. And so um, one, a, a key point of, of the work that we are doing in Tamara in creating what we call a healing biotope is really to reimagine not only 
what is human consciousness, but also what are social conditions and also ecological conditions in our relation to the natural world where love is not only um, in, in a way up to the individual spiritual power, but where, the, where there is a condition that will um, accelerate the growth of consciousness, if you will, because you can live in a surrounding again, in a network of relations with among people, between parents and children, between men and women, but also between humans and the natural world and the waters and landscape where we actually can open our heart because we no longer have to suppress the consequences of our actions. And so yeah, for me, this systemic uh, distinction is, is a really important one in this conversation to know that we are on the right level. And in that, yeah, as Sabina already said, the uh, understanding the workings of love, also of erotic love, this point, yeah, this, uh, where love can actually flip into its opposite, into hatred. Those are key distinctions that I think will be um, central to whether also a new form of activism, a spiritual activism can succeed. Can we transform the structures within ourselves, which we see in the world as, as so destructive? Yes, and you also, in Tamara, you make the point that um, they, within the group are all the dynamics of the whole of humanity. Uh, and, and, even, and as you said just now, Martin, that, the, <clears throat> that within oneself um, are all of these. So, so there's, a, there's a microcosm, mesocosm, and a macrocosm here. Thank you. Um, just to say that um, our panelist, Anaya Sophia, um, is, is trying to join, but, but she uh, couldn't find the link, and so I sent her the link, but I don't know whether she's still at her computer, um, Georg, um, and whether there's any, any way we can facilitate that. Um, so any, we'll look out for her, because I think she is trying to join us. So let's go over to... Um, the link uh, again. I'm on it. Yeah. We'll go over to Professor Stephen Post um, at uh, Case Western University. Um, St Stephen has, has done a lot of research um, uh, much of which has been um, sponsored by the um, uh, John Templeton Foundation. He, he knew Sir John Templeton very well, um, and he's done a lot of research on, on love and forgiveness. And so he, he comes at, comes at the, the, the topic also from a, an empirical um, as well as a personal point of view. Stephen. Um, thank you, David. It's a delight to be with uh, all of you, and I'm learning uh, every moment. It's always a steep curve for me. Um, we've used the word love, and, and I'll just toss out uh, a definition that I like to use, which I learned from a psychiatrist at the University of Chicago by the name of Harry Stack Sullivan. And the definition doesn't rely on ancient languages. Uh, it's very straightforward. When the happiness and the security of another is as real or meaningful to me as my own, or possibly more so, I love that person. Let me just try that again. When the happiness and security of another is as real and meaningful to me as my own, or possibly more so, I love that person. And that holds, whether I'm at Starbucks with an old friend who's lost a job and can't make ends meet and just need someone to really listen and maybe fill in a few gaps, whether I'm looking over the crib of a grandchild, uh, whether I'm thinking about uh, 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 some wonderful physician here in the hospital who just uh, has so much devotion to, uh, to patients, uh, it seems to hold pretty well. So that's my definition of human love. But then I really want to reaffirm what David said so well and what, what everyone has said too, Sabine and uh, everyone has. There is a, a higher uh, energy of love. I actually met um, Pitram Sorokin when I was a high schooler in New Hampshire at a Episcopal boys school at the time. And uh, it was about 1967. He died in 1969. And um, 
And for that reason, uh, with Sir John's help, Sir John Templeton's help, we did, in fact, republish The Ways and Power of Love, and I wrote it <laughs> forward to it. And I met his son, who's still alive and lives in Boston, is a physiologist who worked at uh, Boston University for many years. But uh, Sorokin was one who really believed that it wasn't adequate to simply talk about human love, which is important. Uh, but he thought there had to be reference to a higher experience, not concept so much as experience. And so I, I thought I would read just in five lines an example of what I'm talking about, because you may think I'm a little crazy to say this, but this is from the great poet W.H. Auden, who hung around Oxford and the coffee shops and the chapels and had a big following in his day. He's sitting in on one of the lawns of one of the Oxford colleges with his friends, with uh, four friends. And then suddenly he says, I felt myself invaded, interesting metaphor, by a power which, though I consented to it, was irresistible and certainly not mine. For the first time in my life, I knew exactly, because thanks to that power, I was doing it what it means to love one's neighbor as oneself. I was also certain, though the conversation continued to be perfectly ordinary, that my colleagues were having the same experience. In the case of one of them, I later confirmed this. My personal feelings toward them were unchanged. They were still colleagues, not intimate friends, but I felt their existence as themselves to be of infinite value, and I rejoiced in it. So he's sitting there on the lawn and he has this experience. Now, Larry Dossey, author of One Mind, would say he was a noticer. He noticed the experience. And I think all of us can benefit by being noticers, if I can use that word. So uh, just a little anecdote, and then I'm going to pipe down. Uh, but I was sitting here in this office. I'm actually at Stony Brook University Medical School in New York, uh, having moved from Cleveland and Case about 12 years ago. And that image on the wall there begins the whole culture of this institution. It's the heart of care and the heart of love. And it moves out concentrically into the care of patients and into the culture and into forming uh, uh, what we call uh, uh, circles of trust. And we've really created a culture of love in this hospital, which was really important because we at one point had 700 uh, active COVID cases in our intensive care unit, which took over five floors. Uh, and I did a lot of counseling of families on Zoom and in the lobby because they couldn't get in to see their patients. Part of my job as a, as a, as a consultant in clinical ethical decisions. But what I want to say is that um, I was sitting here in my office five years ago and there was a Korean American student who came in. She was a med student in her second year and she was feeling very uh, alienated from her environment. She was very deeply Christian in her case and she just didn't get the world here. So I said, look, um, why don't you send me an email and we'll make an appointment for next week. But then I felt an energy over my right shoulder. I didn't see anything there. I turned around and I looked, there was nothing, obviously, but still it was very powerful and it was very warm. And it conveyed to me conceptually, I have to drop everything and just take care of this young woman, which I did. I canceled all my appointments for the day and I spent the next three hours with her. She did leave medical school, but she came back the next year. I was her mentor for her year off and she came back and now she's practicing preventive medicine and I'm officiating over her wedding uh, in the near future, uh, <laughs> believe it or not on Zoom. So, um, you know, there is this energy in the universe and I'm always um, wanting to be someone who notices it. And Sorokin too had many such experiences. He was, he was not, just what I call a hypercognitive. Uh, he was someone who was very spiritually experiential in his qualities. And that, that takes us beyond um, simply human capacities to a, a living reality of 
a force in this universe, an energy in this universe that is pure unlimited love. So I'm gonna end here, but just to make you grin a little bit. Um, yeah, I knew Sir John for like 20 years. We were very close. And um, I was sitting in my office at Case Western in the med school. Um, and I also study immunology and such things. And I got a fax from Sir John. He loved to fax. He was faxing from Nassau. Um, and he said, Stephen, we have to start an institute to study the greatest experience that humans can have. And it's not just human love, but it's the experience of this supreme love, this bliss. And as he said, it's not I love you, but it's I am love, right? And they called him the Tennessee mystic, right? The great investor was also the Tennessee mystic. And we were so close and I still miss him. And, and so I faxed back, Sir John, what should we call it? Uh, and he said, the Institute for Research on Unlimited Love. Now, okay, I admit that this is a confession. I faxed back, Sir John, <laughs> maybe we should call it the Institute for Creative Altruism, taking a line off Sorokin. And I got a fax back. No, Stephen, I think unlimited love up to $8.9 million. And I faxed back. Sir John, I love that language. It jumps right off the page. But he was completely correct because, uh, you know, it allowed us to really have rapport with that higher spiritual dimension of love. And we did fund over 100 studies all over the country from Harvard to IONS and Dow to Chair and science, theology, and love at Harvard Divinity School and did many such things. And the Institute is www.unlimitedlove.org. But then I'll end this here because, you know, we all benefit when we think about it from the people who inspire us. You know, life isn't something I make. I don't believe in that. It's a journey. And so we respond to people along the way. And hopefully in that response, we we are creative and, and, and we grow. So uh, Sir John died in uh, 2008, just as I was leaving Cleveland and coming to New York. And uh, his uh, two weeks before he died, his son, Jack, who was a pediatric trauma surgeon at uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, uh, called me on my flip phone at the time. And he said, Stephen, dad is dying. And he has a favor to ask of you. And I said, well, Jack, I'll do anything if Sir John thinks it would be helpful to him. And so Jack said, yeah, he has, a, he has something he wants you to do. He wants you to write a book that will kind of capture all of his ideas about the ontological metaphysical reality of love that we can connect with in these transformative moments. And so I said, well, Jack, that's great. What's he want it to be called? And so Jack said, well, uh, ultimate reality is unlimited love. So I had just a moment of pause. So I said, Jack, could you go back to J dad's bed and ask him, can we have a question mark? <laughs> so he came back like three, three minutes later, huffing and puffing. Yeah, dad says it's okay. Is ultimate reality unlimited love question mark? So I wrote that book for the Templeton Foundation and it's kind of the summa of, the, of their tradition. Although people stray from those big metaphysical questions because they think it's just somehow controversial. And, and uh, uh, but but uh, it, it, it really is the case that we need to pay attention to that. Um, Maybe one last really funny thing. When I got to Stony Brook, there was a cub reporter from a local paper who wrote an article about the unlimited love side of me. I was here to, to teach medical students compassionate interactions and to change a culture, which we did. We were actually just acknowledged as the national leader in medical education for a culture of compassionate care and training for our students and practice by the Alpha Omega Alpha, uh, which is really impressive for everybody here. But um, I, I walked into a pizza place in Stony Brook and there was a paper, the Three Village Herald, and there was only one headline in, on it. It was so embarrassing. I almost died. It said, unlimited love comes to Stony Brook. And this cub reporter had interviewed the dean here, who was a pediatric uh, transplant surgeon, and my department chair. And they said, well, we are not sure about that stuff, but we like them for what we're hiring them for. So I rode up the escalator my first day at work and there was this guy who looked like Mr. Clean. He had 
you know, big muscles and he, and, and, and he had a rough accent and he looked down at me and, and I said, sir, do I know you? And he said, are you Dr. Post? <laughs> I said, yes, I am. And he said, are you going to save us? <laughs> And I said, no, no, I'm not. It's not my agenda, but I'm glad to be here. And we became very good friends. But sometimes, you know, you have to take difficult moments and you have to expand the canvas. And love really requires that of us. We have to be bold and move ahead. And Sir John was always like that. And, um, and we can all be like that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed, Stephen. The very, very different um, perspective, but, a, but an extremely valuable one. I'll just add one story from the, the book, Unlimited Love, which struck me. <clears throat> it's a while since I read it, so I might not have the details, but the point will come across clearly. There, there was a woman who was in a, an apartment, I think possibly in Paris, and um, a, a burglar came in um, and was, was uh, right, taking her jewelry. <clears throat> and and she, she turned to him and said, uh, you know, there's some far more valuable jewelry in that drawer over there. Why don't you take that as well? And, and she was so taken aback, sorry, he was so taken aback by this, this um, the old woman telling him to help himself to more jewelry that was more valuable than what he'd already found, that he just rushed out of the flat and he never came back. Uh, so that there's a disarming quality there as well, which I think that that you you highlighted there, Stephen, with, with your your recollections of Sir John. Yeah, yeah so, if you're going to be so, successful with this, you have to have a certain whimsical quality, because if you're yeah. overbearing, people get tired of you very quickly. Yeah, indeed. Uh, can I just ask Georg? Is there any sign of um, Anaya? Um, oh, you know? Not really. I've sent it a link several times. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, well, we'll have to we'll have to, we'll have to proceed without her. Um, but just to to, to tell you um, <clears throat> that the people on the call here and um, that what the reason that I had Anaya coming, she's a neighbour of mine, um, so I really should have her mobile, um, but I'm afraid I don't. Uh, and she's she's just written a very powerful book called Fierce Feminine Rising, Fierce Feminine Rising, and and the. It's it's about the um, the, the destructive um, or, or the, <clears throat> the the Kali energy, um, which is transformative, and and one of the, the one of the things that she one of the points she makes um, uh, is that this is really a download from this energy, and it's incredibly powerful. If you read just the first few sentences, it really blows you away, and then in the um, at the end of each chapter, she has sorrows of the world. Uh, and the, these are some of the outrageous things that we are doing as humans, either to ourselves or to nature um, or to animals. Uh, and which really, you know, just make you think, how, how can we do this? This really is just appalling. Um, and so there's an there's a activism um, which is generated from this as well, as well as the spiritual journey. And so, so the, 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 this, I think that the theme that I'd like to pursue is this, is how do we, how do we combine um, you know, our inner journey with our outer journey? How do we transform ourselves from within, but also um, how do we help transform the systems? And that means getting together in order to do this. And I'd like to um, see if I can take some, some questions from um, the chat box, but what I'm seeing at the moment uh, is um, quite a lot of comments, um, but no questions as yet. Um, would, uh, uh, Martin and um, Sabine, would you like to come back at all on um, what Stephen's been sharing or, or add something of your own? Uh, first of all, thank you for all what you shared. And uh, by listening, I again feel that uh, also especially when you speak about the feminine rising, mm -hmm. that is always this question that we are coming, that we are in a transformation from a patriarchal culture to, uh, I hope, to a partnership culture. And there it's so much, we speak so much about the unity. We know that love is something which is connected in the consciousness to unity. 
And on the other side, we are living in a polarity. And also we are living with this question, how is the body system connected with a meta meta metaphysical system? And there I feel, you know, that in Tamara, we also work a lot with the question, what, how is the connection of love and sexuality? Mm. And especially if we know how many people at this moment, in this special moment, commit suicide because they are so desperate and they, they want love and they try to love and suddenly they feel hurt and it shifts to the opposite, to hatred, to fear of loss. And there I feel this, uh, that um, we are in a, in a moment where we have done to the earth's body the same like in the last centuries, women were treated mm -hmm. without really connection between contact. Yeah? yeah, it was domination. And then we created a system where it's so, so much about the perpetrator and the victim. And we are always in it. So the perpetrator is as well a victim of a system as uh, the victim is a victim of a system. And how can we really figure out to transform the perpetrator victim pattern? And I feel that in love, there is a, a wisdom, how to overcome it. And I feel that we have to dare also to, uh, to name the, the sexual questions. And I feel it's in the... In a way, it's the same like we deal with fire and water on this planet. We used a lot of fire. Firing is the energy of the patriarchal culture. We are no more aware where is our water coming from. Most people use the water without knowing where it's coming from. And so the earth body is in emergency situation. And how do we create systems where we are aware again, to balance these different energies in a way that the abundance of life can come back. So that uh, plants, animals, growth can really come back. And also in sexuality, I think often people feel that sexuality itself is um, violent. And so we tried to find regulation of marriages, of faithfulness, and we don't see that this is also a reason why so much violence is happening right now, that people suppressed energies mm. and suddenly they explore and the energy becomes violent. And it's with the water. If you put it in a dam and suddenly the dam breaks, then water becomes violent, but not the water itself is violent. And this is the same with sexuality. So I feel when we are speaking about love, it's so important to figure out our relation to matter, our real relation to the body system as a conscious system and to our metaphysical connection to the universe. And there it's so much about purifying religion also, I think it was mm -hmm. mentioned because religion was misused. And so we don't, we are not anymore connected to the source where we feel this is real divine power. And so there are so many things to study and to clarify in relating to the question, which kind of system change is really needed right now from us as humanity. And I often feel that so many people say it's about love and it is about love for sure. And on the other side, uh, when I see right now in the United States what is happening with the Sending Rock people, where, how to uh, find an activism which is not acting against the system, but which is really coming from this compassion of the heart and really support where there is such a suffering. And our relation to indigenous, for example, what is indigenous wisdom and not to go back but to relate to it, it's, it's in a way we all have a seat where we are coming from. So what is the real humane seat where we find back to the wisdom of natural growth? This is for me so much the question where we are mm. in as humanity right now on many different levels and how to find the power of cooperation 
instead of power of domination. Also the word power, often we have fear, fear of power, yes, of course, but there is a soft power, which is the, na the natural power of compassion and life. So we, and this is a different power than the power of domination. So a lot of questions we mm -hmm. are touching and it's beautiful to have this conversation. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think that the, a lot of people are asking, you know, how, how in a practical sense, you know, is, does the transformation take place? What is a tipping point? Um, what's required, you know, to bring a tipping point about? And we, we talked a little bit about this this morning in, in, in our, um, our session with, with Andrew Fellows. And, and we, earlier this week, we, we had a presentation from a complexity theorist friend of mine from Brussels called Vasilios Basios on precisely this question of, of tipping points and complexity. And he says, well, within any system, there are, there are these fluctuations. These are event, events of fluctuations, and they, they can lead to um, a bifurcation going in either direction. And that's what I was trying to get at in my in, in the early slide that, that um, there are two forms of unity. Um, there's an enforced uniformity unity, which we see in China, um, where stability equals control. Um, and then there's the unity and diversity, which we see in nature, which is what we are, I think, fundamentally designed um, to, to fulfill because it, 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 it corresponds to our own deepest need and our own transcendent freedom um, as um, Michael uh, Lerner puts it. And I, I, I see this, um, uh, one of the big issues here is that the, 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 the powers um, have this um, great reset. Um, and this is the vocabulary they're using. This is World Economic Forum, the great reset. And the great reset involves transhumanism, um, which involves um, implants in us and, and kind of digital control, which in turn, I see, um, reflects an image of the human being as a machine. Uh, and so it seems to me that the, the mechanistic um, metaphor informing science and technology has kind of got out of control. And, and there's what Rupert Sheldrake, he calls this mechanomorphism, not anthropomorphism. He says, you know, we, we, we invent uh, machines and then we start explaining ourselves in terms of machines if we are machines when we aren't. And so the, 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 the fundamental conception of the human being uh, is really at stake here. And, and I, I wonder whether any of you got any, any thoughts on that. Well, I mean, transhumanism does view us as machines to be enhanced with regard to longevity, with regard to artificial happiness, with regard uh, to uh, intelligence, uh, and so forth, et cetera. And ultimately it's a terrible uh, perspective because it really misses out on what really is within us and the kinds of transformations that we truly need because if we're just nasty, brutal, selfish, greedy entities, but we're living longer and we're smarter and we have more in vitro fertilization, it's not gonna make a better world. And I was just going to say one thing, too, about um, uh, activism. So I believe, uh, and I've always believed, that every human being, without any exception, has a calling. You can think about calling in a spiritual way. You can think about it epigenetically. You can think about it in lots of different ways. But there's something that we can get in touch with within ourselves and have the confidence to follow it. So like in, like in my case, you know, I was an immunologist at Penn, I quit. Went to the University of Chicago Divinity School to study with Mersha Eliade, Joseph Campbell, Csikszentmihalyi, people like that. And I studied world religions and, and love and did it with psychological scientific underpinnings. But then, uh, I went right over to the medical school and I've been in med schools in Chicago, Michigan, Case Western here, all these years, 35 years, only because I wanted to be an activist. And I've come into these environments and sometimes I've gotten a little bit of a jaded look, 
you know but um in the end it's been it's been beautiful because i've i've felt always guided and it's always been a kind of a divine journey even though you know i don't speak like this with all the people around me obviously or i'd probably not last terribly long but but everybody has a calling and if everybody follows their love calling i mean in the in the upanishads our purpose is to be agents of uh, perfect pure love in freedom and in creativity that's it that's why we're here we can all do that and if we all just make that our priority and don't get diverted because it's easy to get diverted, you know, a little more money over here, a little more prestige over there, whatever it might be, just don't get diverted, stick with it. If we all do that, the tipping point will come. Thank you very much, Stephen. We have a question here from Veronica um, and there's other questions I'll bring in um, in a moment. Um, how does Martin feel about the topics we're discussing? I want to teach my grandson how to embrace his future and live differently from me and us, the old generation. Martin. Yeah, well, that's also a broad question because so much is being touched, but maybe I just continue weaving on this line also with what, what was mentioned about. Uh, and maybe bring, up, bring in your own experience of how you, how you got to Tamara and, and you, oh, wow. you sort of thought, well, what's the point of going to university when I could go to the University of Life, as it were? Okay, well, that's another thing again. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, I, as a, as a young person growing up in this Western society, I, as a teenager, really had this existential crisis, I can say, of understanding more and more what kind of system is governing the world and also what is in a way the what is the future um, that was that I was supposed to fulfill a role in and I was really questioning everything and was thrown into depression and had this whole crisis of meaning and yeah it's interesting because David maybe then I can also fit it fit my own story back into the uh, thread because you were speaking about these um these different principles of, of unification and um yeah unity and diversity because i felt as a young person such a strong need for political change and for um, addressing um all these terrible um systems of power um, especially capitalism and fas like uh, right-wing fascism and at the same time, I realized that being in activist groups, uh, I, there was talk about a different world, but there was very little felt experience. And so what really drew me to study at Tamara was that there was, a, and there still is, a, a strong vision for system change and um, the consciousness and also the practice that this system change will really rely on a different human experience where that inner foundation in consciousness for why we create systems of exploitation and all of this on the outer where this is actually transformed in a way that we will naturally want to create a world that is based on sharing on love because we can also ask ourselves where does capitalism really originate if not in an inner mindset a state of consciousness that is based on scarcity on fear on yeah the the constant need of not having enough and so i also feel when we look uh, I will get back now to the transhumanism. When we look into in humanity right now, it's, I mean, I feel it's such a strong reflection that almost the only movement that really has this really big utopian thinking is a movement that basically wants to overcome human existence in physical bodies, which is, which is what transhumanism is really about. Like we are, um, like it is based on such a par paranoid fear um, of, our mortality and of our physical central existence and so i for me this is really a reflection of what sabina spoke earlier about this broken relationship um, with our own central erotic selves which is then reflected in our broken relationship with with the earth around us and so it is we are at a very critical point now because from that mindset we have destroyed uh the capacity of the natural world, the earth, to support human life um, in a way that 
um, human survival is really on the edge now and constantly the transhumanist movements movement tells us um, we can create new technologies to resolve the problems that former technology has created and uh, yeah I feel that um, when I think about what is really the shift that can allow this kind of activism to succeed then I think it is really rooted in a different relation of human beings among one another but also of humanity with the earth and so there it is so important that coming back to the unity and diversity that different groups of people different groups of change makers of wisdom keepers cooperate in ways that have never cooperated before so um yeah activists with people who build systemic alternatives indigenous people who hold wisdom about earth connection um this is i think it is really um yeah we have to become a super organism in a way where we uh develop those lines of cooperation but in the center i think it really needs a vision of where do we want to go so in a way we have to uh so who are we same who are level we? Of, sorry. We go. who are we and we want to go you know yeah so the, the definition of the human and where we're going and that, that, that you can't really separate them out i don't think may i add something yeah. what i feel so important in the whole question now that we mentioned also before the question of individu individualism and uh, the collective body and i feel in our societies right now we see the collective body on the shadow side. We see how fascism could grow, how dictatorship will grow. And there, this kind of uh, culture of love is not a field building thing. If we speak of the, the word of field building of Robert Sheldrick, mm -hmm. I think we are not aware that the societies we are living in, we are living in field. Mm. We, are, we are dominated by certain fields. And if we speak of who am I, then I could not answer this. I, that I can speak mm. here, that I'm able to think how, who, who knows? One time I received a name, I'm full of conditioning, I'm full of uh, education. But there is something higher, there is something mm. where I have an organism where my heart and my liver and my lung, they have to cooperate that the whole organism can work. And I feel this is the real individualism that we figure out again who and where is my real call, who I'm meant to be in an organism. And there I want to bring in the word community. I feel that we as humanity lost the universal wisdom of community. And there is so much criminality. There is so much of uh, this kind of hypnosis of fear because there are power systems, imperialistic systems, but the communities of trust as an organism in a bigger organism mm. doesn't really exist anymore. And there I feel it's so much about healing what is real tribal wisdom, not to repeat, to go back to the past, but to understand that life is always organized in a community system and individual beings are always part of one organism and not only a human organism, a universal one. And I think this is the what yes. also bring people here to study, to relate on the technological, ecological, social question, to create this kinds of system where we can live healthy again in cooperation with the whole. Mm. And we, we have, Peter Dunoff also uses this, this analogy of the body and, and that the individual you know, organs within the body, they work for the, the good of the whole. So we already have the example and the healing is, is trying to bring this wholeness and vitality and energy back. So we have the example of what we need to do within our own bodies, within our microbiome. And, and we've got an example of how things go wrong in our own bodies as well. Um, I was uh, looking at something yesterday and he said, well, well if, when you get cancer, the, the, the tumor reorganizes the system, quote unquote. Um, and, and so the, the, to understand that deeply, um, how, how our own health depends on this collaboration, cooperation, community, uh, right down to the cellular level, um, it, then we can then translate that outwards um, into the body politic, as it were, or the community. 
So, so I, I, I'd like to reinforce that, that point. Yeah. Me too. Uh, on on community, if I can just say about community, com I, I so agree with you and everybody. If you're going to change a culture, you have to create a community because it's not likely to be there necessarily. I, I mean, what we do across this medical center, you know, 2,000 clinicians at one point, 900 COVID patients. In every clerkship for the medical students, in every residency program, in every department, we have small groups of seven to eight. And we use a concept that Parker Palmer oh. created, circles of trust. And there are kind of rules of the circle, right? So attentive listening, people speaking not about the case or the patient, but about their own emotions in response to their experiences, the things that keep them up at night, the things that they, 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 they really want to talk about with their colleagues, but never get a chance. And so it's all about attentive listening and not reacting, but responding and maybe having a gentle question rather than a too easy answer. But we actually teach them the rules of, of, of the circles of trust all across this institution. And uh, it really helps because the goal we all know is to give more compassionate care, really compassionate care to patients and not just lose that in this crazy technocracy. Uh, and, and we're actually able to do that. I mean, we're, 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 we, we've been able to shift um, the culture by building communities. And then the communities, the small circles become larger circles and we have Schwartz rounds with whole departments it's incredibly beautiful to build a community of people to galvanize their commitment to the reason they came into nursing or medicine to begin with, which was to provide truly compassionate care. So community is everything. You can't just do it solo. Thank you very much indeed. And I, I, think, I think that we, there are places that we can all start within where we are. And, and you know, my experience of of community where I live in a rural village in France. That's been reinforced um, by the, the, um, the COVID confinement. And, and really everybody's really more looking out for each other than they did before. And so if, if this is ripples across the world and each, each of us need, you know, can ask ourselves uh, within our own immediate context and circles, you know, how, how can I create circles of trust? How can I, how can I create um, communities of care? Um, I just want to um, bring in one other point here, um, and that is uh, the, um, the writings of my, my friend, uh, the, the psychiatrist and cultural historian Ian McGilchrist, um, and his, his masterwork is called um, The Master and His Emissary, and it's The Divided Brain and, and the History of the Western World. And his basic diagnosis, he's just written a 400,000 word sequel, goodness knows what the publisher is going to do with that. Uh, is, is that we as a culture have overemphasized the left hemisphere, the analytical faculty, the critical analytical faculty. We've underestimated the intuition, the creativity, um, the care. Uh, he, he once gave a talk at our Beyond the Brain conference, which was called um, Right Hemisphere Doesn't Do Compassion. And, and, <clears throat> and, and so I, 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 what's missing in a lot of the, the discourse, not in this event, uh, is the heart. And, 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 and this is, the transhumanism is completely missing the heart. And it's all about the machine and the, and the, and the critical thinking and the left hemisphere and the analysis. And you know, it just disappears up its own orifice in that sense. Uh, so so how, how, my, my, my question is how, how we bring more balance into, into our society. And, and the, the, I think we've got some answers also coming in on the chat box. Anyone like to uh, come in on that? Or should I just say that's a point and we'll pass on to the next one? I only uh, want to, to bring in one point when you mentioned this, the question of the heart. I feel that uh, this is the crucial point that um, are we able again to really open our heart? And there uh, for me, we touch also the trauma question because I feel that we, in which culture ever we grew up, there is a point where we all touch an inner trauma, which we normally don't want to touch again. 
So there is a, a real quick reflex. If someone comes closer to the personal trauma, we start to defend ourselves. So how to bring in into our societies this new kind of thinking of a culture of love. For me, it's so much about uh, training and the learning to create reconciliation circles and to create, create forms of deep listenings where we don't uh, react too quick to each other. Because I also know that many, many people try to build community and without having really some tools or some support to do it, it creates often even deeper wounds. So for me, the, the vision of a universal community has to, fa to face also the pain of our time. And I think there we need uh, study places to really understand it more and more deep. And I would also say that it's to see the ego points. I think the ego is created out of fear and without judging to become aware of it and to learn to bear witness what my ego starts to, to do and what would the higher self do to come to this, that we really face in our own development, this difference. And there is a difference. I think life itself is always directed towards healing and the ego system is always trying to protect the old system. And there we are in as humanity, very strong. This is quite both, mm. both sides. It's like we are in the middle of the apocalypse where we see how much violence is growing but I feel also that at many, many places, a new uh, wave of relating back to the power of trust of the universe is happening. And the trauma work is very needed inside of this. I feel this is an important point. Absolutely. And, and this has come up in the, in the chat as well. I've just been looking at uh, you know, some of the reactions here. And um, so I, 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 I wonder um, what's happened to the the elders. Um, there was, I think, Richard Branson started up the um, a, a group of elders because it seems to me that the the elder function is missing um, broadly at a a planetary level, and that we we need somehow to to uh, come together um, uh, or to to find um, the elders who who can really um, give us that wisdom and compassion. And exemplify that, and um, uh, that that can shift, help shift the field in some way. And I think what the Dalai Lama um, is is been saying recently is is absolutely spot on. And, and uh, on Monday it's his 85th birthday, and and there is a, a further celebration, um, I think, going to be happening. And he's also going to be talking about his old friend David Bohm. And then this book, this film, Infinite Potential, has just come out um, very recently. And so I, I the a lot of people are saying, well, what can we do collectively? How, how can we come together? Um, obviously, this initiative, Jim, um, is is an amazing contribution to this very process of, of coming together and in conversation and, and talking and seeing what we can learn from each other and then what we can take away um, to take forward. And, and you and Tamara, um, for instance, I know you're actually living this and, and, and this experiment, this healing biotope. And so you're a microcosm of what the possibilities are for, for developing, you know, creative and healing forms of, of community. So I, I asked the question about uh, elders. Um, anybody got any thoughts on that? Well, one thing I'd say is that in our modern industrial societies, young <laughs> folks don't go to their grandparents so much for wisdom. They go to the latest software and um, everything is about transmission every quality gratitude kindness forgiveness uh, generosity all these things are a matter of generativity of passing the torch from one generation to another it's all role modeling and being there i was at a restaurant in new york with a buddy of mine named nick dungan uh, at a French restaurant and we saw a three generational family at the table next to us. There was grandma and grandpa, 
and there were the parents, and then there were the two kids, maybe five and six years old, completely locked in to their iPads. And as this conversation went on, they were totally in a different world. They were in exile. And so that flow that goes on was very much interrupted. And I think that's a huge problem. So uh, I like these programs like Screenagers, like Screens and Teens, and the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the whole NIH having an entire three-day meeting on how we can manage to recreate community and, 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 and these kinds of character strengths in a world that is so technologically dominated. Indeed. Um, and I, uh, I, I run a program called Inspiring Purpose. Um, and I'm just putting the link in there, inspiringpurpose.org. It's, it's been suspended, obviously, in schools because of the problems we've been having. Um, but what I was struck, um, that what we do is we have a, we have a poster template um, where people think about their qualities, their, their strengths, and what they need to work on. Then they think about someone who inspires them. Uh, and then they, they think about you know, the future, um, how do we create a sustainable world? Uh, how do we become planetary citizens? So they answer all these questions in a structured way. And at a certain point, when, before um, this went into um, you know, the formats we've been using, uh, we, we enabled children to choose family members, and quite a lot of them chose grandparents. And, and, and so it was very heartening to see that there was actually a special relationship um, between the grandparents and the grandchildren and with some wonderful stories. And also it gives them their first, um, their, their first understanding of death and separation and loss. Um, and some of them would write about the loss of a grandparent, the illness of a grandparent, the resilience of a grandparent in illness. So the, these are all um, life lessons which, which can only be learned you know, through experience. Yeah, I, I think you are touching a very crucial issue and especially by the try to build a community and to create a model here, the question of the relation between the generations is very, very important. And especially when I see to all the movements now from the young people who go to the streets because of climate change, Friday for Future, all the ones. I remember myself like we went to the streets when we heard about Vietnam and so on. And now it's so important that we as elder, we say we are in your back mm. and we, we can tell about our mistakes, but we, we create this kind of relationship of trust. And so in Tamara, we have the grandmas and the daughters and the daughter of the daughter and the next baby. And really to find the, the line of trust between generation, for me, it's also so important. And there we need to include the question of death. How do we want to die? We cannot go on with fear of death by protecting ourselves, but to, crea to create a natural environment where death is part of eternal life where we find back to this kind of real trust. For me, these are all social questions of a new society and a new planet Earth where we are dreaming for. Yeah. And, and, and that, that is the seventh generation, which is our, with our short-term society. We don't have that in mind at all. Um, we're, we're coming to a close um, and, and in terms of the timing that Jim um, asked me to keep to, but uh, he hasn't got his video on at the moment, he's, uh, and he's muted, but I, I'd like to invite Jim to see whether he has any reflections himself on the, the wide-ranging exchange that we've had, um, Jim, in Shark. <laughs> what an uh, extraordinary discussion. I've been uh, tracking it uh, very attentively as you've been uh, uh, talking for the last 90 minutes. And David, I just, first of all, I wanna commend the skill with which you've moderated and teased out uh, some of these very profound issues. You know, uh, love like hope and faith and justice is something we intuitively know, but it's very hard to put in words. You know, it's uh, what really is love? 
you know, how do you really define it? And, you know, it's uh, 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 the way that you open with the different quotes from the different leaders and thinkers, I think was, was very uh, inspirational. Uh, and for me, I, I would, I think there are two things that are distilling in my mind. One, uh, the point that you made, Sabina, around uh, love and trauma. I think that's a profound notion in a world that is highly traumatized. You know, I think it's, it's really important for us to bear in mind that context shapes content. Love means one thing, you know, on a beach in the South Pacific uh, where you're with your lover. Uh, love means something else when you're in the middle of South Side Chicago and George Floyd has just been kneed to death. So the relationship that I think that, that we need to ponder very deeply in the world right now is the relationship between love and trauma. Because we have traumatized the earth, we have traumatized each other, we are now in a technocratic culture, as you were pointing out, David, where the grandkids when they've got their grandparents right across the table are staring into their iPads. So they're missing the very experience that they need to um, be authentically present in community with people who are soon going to die. And as we all know, when, who have lost our parents or our grandparents or, or whoever, once you're dead, you're dead and you're gone. And you've got nothing but memory and possibly regrets that you didn't spend more time because you were too involved with playing some video game uh, on your iPhone. So I, I think, uh, you know, it's almost worth uh, another session on this relationship between love uh, and uh, trauma. Uh, because as Thomas Hubel and others have pointed out, we're in the grip of transgenerational trauma, the accumulated trauma of generations that, again, as Sabina was pointing out, distorts our very sexuality. And I, I want to, uh, that was the second point I wanted to, to uh, just underscore and just to remind everybody that Plato in his masterwork on love, the symposium. You know, the ancient Greeks had multiple words for love. And the word that Plato chose for his symposium, for his ultimate definition of love, was eros. Because he understood that at its root, love is sexual. Love is erotic. Love is physical. Love is what bounds binds us to each other in the urge of not only passion, but procreation. Because it's that love, that er er erotica, that allows nature and life to continue on in the universal formation of things. And I think that, that the, the, the point that Plato makes in the symposium is worth contemplating today and particularly in a world of trauma, is that when you, when you understand the relationship between eros and love, you end up with an adoration of beauty. Mm. And in, in, in Plato's notion, um, uh, love is a great, what he calls mediatrix. Love is that which binds all of life together and brings us into higher and higher imaginal realms until we understand that the, the whole universe is a, is a beautiful ornament, a great song. So just like we should contemplate the relationship between love and trauma, I think we also need to contemplate the relationship between love and beauty. 
because that great kind of complexio oppositorum, as Jung would say, would put it, is I think the, for me, the kind of uh, a great dialectic of love that, that we, we live each day of our lives um, in, in, the, um, in the grip of. And uh, so I've, I've been inspired by this, uh, uh, this session and uh, would, uh, we may have a, a enough time left for each of you to just give a one minute final word. I would love, I'd love each of you having had this discussion in a minute, what is love? Uh, I'm take? gonna offer something. Uh, sure. I have a favorite quote, Eleanor Roosevelt, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that's really important. And our dream is love. But when we pursue love, I have another favorite quote from Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, metaphorically stated, the children of light must have the cunning of the children of darkness, but none of their malice. There's going to be a lot of things that will try to trip you up. There's sharks in the water. There's evil in the universe. And, uh, and so you have to be careful. I just want to say also, anybody who wants to email me, if I can say this, go right ahead. Just post at stephengpost.com with a PH. Be happy to carry on the conversation. Thank you. Those are great quotes. Great quotes. Thank you. Sabine and Martin. <clears throat> so what is love? I will also bring a quote, <laughs> which is uh, one from Rudolf Steiner, actually, the founder of anthroposophic uh, science, who said that love is the experience of the other in one's own soul. And so uh, that is for me a very beautiful way of putting this uh, experience of interdependence that we experience through this process of really recognizing and we often like to say seeing the other um, and yeah that for me is it is really also a matter of of uh, what kind of spaces do we live in and so yeah love is the experience of the other in one's own soul <laughs> beautiful beautiful so I think I don't bring a quote. I feel love is the biggest reservoir of the universe. I think it's in the center of the universe and it's conducting our life in a way that we can awaken to. So I feel I am love is a beautiful sentence and it's conducting the miracle that I can say I am. So, and there where we become conscious of this, there cannot be war. Where there is love, there mm. cannot be war. Mm. So this is coming now to my mind. Thank mm. you. <laughs> the love for me is the essence of life. It's, it's the energy of life itself. And uh, Peter Dunoff, he, he says when we are, we are saying the grace before we eat, the love of God brings fullness and abundance of life. So it's this fullness and abundance of life um, that I'm also feeling in, in, our, in our discussion. And I'd, I'd like to say um, uh, just a more, a more general point is that the way that we, we frame things is often in terms of problems and solutions. You know, we see a problem and how can we, how can we solve that problem? Or issues and challenges, how can we address these issues and challenges? But li life is more than that. And life, life has to be lived rather than solved. Uh, mm. we, 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 we are in the midst of it. We are in the midst of this immensity. We're in the midst of this process, in the midst of polarity. Um, we, we, are, we are part of this. and It is part of us. And so, so it's, it's a, it's a, these are all questions. So we're living into living the questions, as Rilke said, um, rather than coming up short for easy answers. There are no easy answers. Um, the, the, the dialogue is in exploring possibilities and seeing what possibilities we ourselves can help co-create. And as, as you've said, Jim, I, I, I hugely appreciated 
um, what you said. And I, I'd love to do a session bringing in beauty and the role of beauty and the importance of beauty. And that there's, there's lots of other themes that we might um, go into. And, and so I, I'd like to thank um, all of you um, for being part of this. I'm very sorry that um, for technical reasons, um, Anaya Sophia was not able to join us. Maybe we can include her in a, something on beauty at a later stage. Uh, and thank you all um, for your comments uh, in the chat box, everybody who's been here from around the world uh, and those who've been live streaming. Um, thank you for tuning in. And those of you who are looking at this as a recording, um, later, later stage, time, time lapsed. Uh, thank you also. And I hope that, that the reflections um, that uh, we have um, been exchanging will give you some, some nourishment. And I'm reminded of a local museum. I went to see a museum of, of um, well, the great, great uh, Cathar called uh, Deoda Rocher. And he was in communication um, with the great French mystic, um, Simon Vey, and in a letter written in 1942, um, Simon Vey said that nowadays we find that our institutions and cultures offer us what she called une nourriture spirituelle insuffisante, a spiritual nourishment which is insufficient to our needs. Love is that spiritual nourishment that we can give each other in, in, in these circles of trust. So each of us has a circle of influence um, of people that we interact with on a daily basis or in our communication. So each of us has a role to play in this process. We can't do everything at once, but as Mother Teresa said, each of us can do something beautiful for God, something beautiful for love. So perhaps um, we can leave it there and greet each other um, from around the world uh, Jim, thank you very much for organizing this for us. Georg, thank you very much for keeping the show on the road. Uh, and uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, David. Uh, uh, really appreciate that and, and consider that a yes. I would love to be in touch with you about another session about uh, love and beauty and maybe love and trauma. Yeah, uh, these are very rich. And one of the things, reasons why we're going day by day by day, everyone, so we can deepen these dialogues, so we can be reiterative. And uh, 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 so it would be wonderful to have you back uh, with others that you may want to bring in on these, these very deep probing questions that go to the heart of our existential reality. And Sabine and Martin, uh, it's always good to see you. I, I love Tamara. I talk about Tamara whenever I can. It's one of the great light communities uh, on planet Earth. And so I just want to salute you. I mean, we could do a whole session just where you present Tamara as, as one of the real oases in a, a pretty traumatized desert out there. <laughs> so thank you. And uh, uh, Mark, you and so I should be in uh, conversation. Um, and Stephen, uh, very good to meet you. you. You've done such extraordinarily deep work with Templeton and, and uh, elsewhere. Uh, and uh, this has been a, been a profound discourse on some of the deepest issues challenging humanity. What is love? And how do we build through love circles of trust and communities of deep caring? Uh, tomorrow, we're going to South Africa with Linda Tucker, uh, who's the great lion woman uh, who has uh, been uh, for many years with the great protector of the white lions. And uh, July 5th is a very special astrological day in relationship to the ancient Egyptian understanding of the white lions. The, the deep mythological um, assertion that the destiny of the white lions and the destiny of the human race are intertwined. And Linda came in to the white lions when there was just a handful left and they were facing extinction. And she understood that she needed to protect those white lions because they were essential to the revitalization of humanity. Uh, so tomorrow we're gonna hear from Linda 
and what she's doing with the white lines. It's if you haven't heard Linda Tucker, she's a very powerful presence and articulator of some very deep truths that, with which we need to grapple. So thank you everyone. Uh, love this panel today. And we'll see you again tomorrow, same time, same station, five o'clock to seven o'clock p.m. Central European time on Zoom. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks. <clears throat>